So I have the great fortune to introduce now David Icke, who is an expert in the sensing space. He is a product of the semiconductor industry, actually. He's a serial entrepreneur. He has run big companies, small companies, literally on the spectrum from teeny tiny, sexy little Cambridge startups all the way to units of industry that are hundreds of millions of dollars. He was the CEO of MC10 for five years, which really pioneered flexible sensing technology. So he is the perfect person to sort of kick off what we want to make us the topic of the next part of today, sensing aspects of health that are normally silent. And the way that Joe Kabedar described this to me, the concept behind it is if you think about how we evolved as humans, why is it that some things hurt, right? So this was funny when Joe described it to me. He said, so if I smacked you across the face or broke your arm, and I was like, oh, he said, that would hurt if you, one of us had that experience. There's pain. But if you have blood pressure issues, high blood pressure, for example, you can't feel it. So what's interesting about the industry today and how quickly it's evolving is sensing technology is closing that gap. So in fact, we can feel these previously silent aspects of our body. And there is no better person to help us think about that than David Icke. So please help me welcome David. Yay! Uh, thank you. Um, hello. Um, I want to start with, a, uh, with just a very quick story. You know, why am I here, right? I'm sort of an accidental healthcare entrepreneur. Uh, I'm not a healthcare guy. Um, I care about health. I want to, you know, I'm concerned about the future of the planet. Uh, but I'm an engineer, so I like to take problems and break them apart and um, solve them. So out of, uh, out of college, I went to work in Silicon Valley building computer chips. And uh, you know, it's a complex process. There are, uh, we had lots of data that told us how chips worked. But uh, most of the data was reactive. It came to us um, after the process. We were flying blind, really, for the 45-day, 300-step process that it takes to put together chips. And only then would we find out what the actual yield um, and functionality of the devices look like. Um, and you know, there was an opportunity to uh, integrate sensing and measurement and simplify massive amounts of data that wasn't being done in real time. It was all being done after the fact. Um, so I spent a lot of the la that next decade working on bringing real time analytics and measurement into semiconductor manufacturing. And that allowed our customers to do things in line, um, you know, solve problems really much more quickly instead of, instead of waiting uh, weeks or months when the results would be much more costly. So um, you know, it really changed how the industry does things. And um, you know, I think we have an opportunity today to do the same kind of things in healthcare. Um, you know, we can't improve what we can't measure, right? And so if what we really need to do is we need to have 24 by 7 truly continuous data collection as we live our daily lives. And then we need to put that into a smart system that enables better health outcomes. And what I'll try to outline for you is um, how that might come together. So what does a smart device do, right? Um, it senses, it analyzes, or computes, and then it provides targeted feedback. And you do that in a loop many, many times, right? And in today's world, this is highly automated, right? We, um, you know, in a connected world, it happens automatically, and it's called the Internet of Things. So you know, Intel has said that the number of connected devices in the world has almost doubled just since 2010 to close to 10 billion. By 2020, it should be 50 billion or more. Uh, you've got other big corporations. Cisco you know, is calling it the Internet of Everything. GE has the industrial internet. So there are big players getting involved. And you know, we end up with connected homes and factories and autonomous cars, lots of cool things. The good news is that um, what it creates is enormous scale that makes sensors robust and cheap, affordable, and we have solutions we can apply across industries. And so the opportunity here is to um, apply that in healthcare. So a show of hands, it's a little hard to see with the light. But um, how many of you are attending this conference for the first time? OK, so yeah, it looks like you know, maybe even half, or maybe those are just the people that come back from lunch uh, promptly. But uh, you know, it's good, because it's really important to get fresh ideas and energy and, and passion um, into uh, solving this problem. And you know, the drivers for this business have never been stronger. right? Many of you are doing great work that are out there 
building real businesses um, with higher urgency than ever before, which is really important when you're solving hard problems. So let's look at um, four main drivers of why this is a good time and why 2014, 2015 um, will be a time that really makes things happen, right? One is the massive problem, and you know, we've ta already talked about that this morning, right? Outsized costs as compared to quality. You know, we saw in the MGH slide costs going up um, 35K per, per pa uh, patient visit. We've got an aging demographic. Um, there'll be twice as many people in this country that are 65 and over one generation from now. So how are we gonna take care of all those people? Um, we've got increasing rates of chronic disease, which only make it worse. And then you know, there's the notorious waste in the healthcare system. So $786 billion in 2013, according to CMS. So big problem, I think we all agree on that, probably preaching the choir. There are also other catalysts for change, right? The accountable care mandate, um, focus on value and outcomes instead of fee for service, that's a great thing. Um, you know, consumers shouldering more of the cost of healthcare, and also a generation, um, younger generation that's facile with technology, but also expects to have a choice as a consumer um, across the board, including you know, when they're dealing with healthcare. Um, healthcare growth itself is, um, you know, if you look at medical device companies, um, probably some of those out, out there in the audience, um, that growth is happening in developing and emerging markets of the world um, where there isn't a legacy system in place that's super high cost. So they're gonna invent the future of healthcare uh, with or without us. And then the last piece is that big technology companies are seeking growth in healthcare, right? If, so if you look at Apple and Samsung and Google and Facebook and Intel and Amazon, you know, in just those six companies, you've got a trillion and a half dollars of market cap that are coming after healthcare and, uh, and they need our help. So there's a real opportunity. Um, the third piece is the technology itself, right? There are enablers in technology that haven't been there before. So low cost devices and sensors um, are now prevalent. You've got pervasive wireless networking, you know, whether it's Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or NFC. Um, you've got data storage, which you know, on a marginal basis is almost free, right? So you can store lots and lots of data. And then you've got the analytics um, to do something with it. And it's not just Watson and IBM, right? It's happening with you know, a lot of companies out there, a number of large companies that are attacking um, the big data problem, so that's good. And then I guess the fourth piece is the ecosystem has to come together, particularly in healthcare, right? So you've got big players, whether it's technology uh, companies, um, you know, the robust startup environment that exists, payers, providers, everybody coming together to solve it, and you've got venues to do that, like, like this conference, which is great. So there's, um, you know, there's a big opportunity um, and a big set of challenges to go after. Um, you know, from an outsider's perspective, again, being an engineer and not a healthcare guy, there's also a lot of low-hanging fruit out there, right? It's not a very data-driven industry. It's episodic, you know, the way that we get data. We, we heard about that this morning. Um, in a lot of cases, we're reactive. So we're doing sick care instead of health care, and we need to be more proactive. And we're still delivering costs in high cost settings. And so the theme of this conference is to figure out a way to do it outside of traditional care settings and lower the cost. And um, you know, there's clearly an opportunity to do that using technology. So I think there are leaders that are out there now taking risk and making things happen. So let's see what that looks like. So how many people in the audience are wearing a Fitbit or Jawbone or Fuel Band or something like that? Okay, you know, a reasonable number of people, right? So industry analysts um, seem to think that connected health and wearables is the next big thing. And that's no guarantee of, you know, ROI or success. But, you know, clearly there's a big opportunity out there. Um, and it makes it an exciting time, without a doubt, to be a part of this. Um, so the premise I want to put in front of you today is that the technology is there to enable um, true body integrated computing. And that will make high quality care available um, outside of traditional care settings. It'll be objective and data driven. It'll be continuous and not episodic. It'll be something we can access as we live our daily lives. Uh, not you know, once every year or two when we go to the doctor's office for a physical exam or worse yet when you know, we hit the ER with something catastrophic. Um, and the output is gonna be a personalized insight that we can use, right? And that can have a couple different forms, right? It's something that boosts motivation or makes us feel good, can reinforce good behavior, or it could flag me as, a, as uh, an individual to take action, could also flag my healthcare provider or a coach or someone else who's gonna help me get that done. So let's, um, let's look at how to get there. Um, 
take a look a little bit at, um, at wearables. And um, you know, bricks and boxes strapped to our chest or wrist were not really you know, elegant wearables, right? But that was the state of wearables even five years ago. When we started MC10 about that time, wearables were dismissed as, as a niche that was you know, trivial. And today, it's really the next paradigm in computing, right? So moving beyond smartphones and tablets um, and complementing them with something that can give us uh, data about our, about our lives as we live them. So you know, what are some key considerations for wearable sensing, right? You know, there's this historically been a trade-off between performance and data quality and the comfort which leads to compliance, right? It's sort of one or the other. You've got high quality inside the doctor's office or lab or at the hospital. Uh, on the upper left, or you've got you know, fitness wearables that um, you know, are miniaturized and can take with you, but you know, if you try a couple different ones out, you get vastly different you know, information and the data is kind of all over the place, right? So there's a, and then you've also had these sort of bricks and belts, you know, Holter monitors you can strap on um, that give you good quality data but aren't things you can really live with or you know, sleep with or take a shower with. So, um, so it's challenging, right? And um, you, know, you want to be on the upper right set of this chart. So um, as you know, the number of consumer products out there has been exploding, right? If you go out to Consumer Electronics Show this year, you know, you know about Jawbone, Fitbit, and Nike, but there are probably three dozen other products out on the market um, in that space. Um, you've also got now a plethora of smartwatches, right? You know, Apple iWatch being the, being the most recent example. So that's continuing to grow. There's a lot of commonality in the underlying technology, and people are still trying to figure out what the real applications and use cases look like, right? You also see big companies getting involved, right? We saw um, Intel getting into wearables through its Basis acquisition. We heard from, from Basis this morning. And you've got Google doing an Android Wear operating system um, to get into wearables. Um, you also now have um, data aggregation happening with Apple's Health Kit or Google Fit or Samsung's SAMI interface. And that gives a connection between apps developers and the wearable data itself. So um, some consumers, you know, it's, it's not all about the wrist, right, even though that's familiar real estate. You know, you see Fitbit on a pocket. You see this is a misfit shine um, that can also be worn on the pocket. And um, so, you know, and there can be applications where going um, outside of the pocket or the wrist are really important, right? If you're both for obtaining and displaying information. And uh, Google Glass is probably the most you know, noteworthy example of that, right? Um, it, you know, its life began as sort of a geeky curiosity. Uh, but today, there are multiple uh, developers that are working on applications, including in healthcare, that will help um, users both obtain information and also access information in a rapid way. So that's, that's a, a game changer. Um, you know, another product I like is, um, is called the Lumoback. So you have a posture strap you wear on your lower back, and it can provide you a gentle little uh, vibration. If you're not sitting up straight, it also ca uh, connects to a smartphone and provides um, data and insight there. So the important thing here is to recognize that different use cases um, can drive different places on the body where you want to measure. And it's also important to know that cons consumers are going to want to either show off their device or in many cases conceal the fact that they're wearing a wearable device, particularly if it has medical applications. So it's not just about the wrist, it's not just about a pedometer. Um, you know, let's look at medical applications, right? Not quite the same uh, consumer design sizzle, right? But you can have wearable patches um, in devices that are acquiring clinical quality data today. And um, you know, Corventis and iRhythm being some examples where they're doing cardiac monitoring for irregular heartbeats, AFib. Um, and communicating that. Uh, vital Connects patch connects vital, you know, collects vital signs and communicates it wirely. And uh, the Visi device from Sotera is really an amazing miniaturization of hospital monitoring technology that's all integrated wirelessly onto a patient's wrist. So um, good quality data, but still you know, in a form factor that's noticeable and sometimes in intrusive to the patient. So how do we really drive market acceptance, right? And I'd make the argument that if we can make uh, sensing itself seamless, that changes the game. So what is seamless sensing, right? It's, it's quality data, so um, high accuracy, high signal to noise. Um, you don't want something that's bouncing around and creating motion artifacts or noise in the data. Um, you want to have something that's almost invisible to the user, right? So something that you apply and forget and move on as part of your normal routine. 
And then it's got to be scalable. So it's got to be something built on conventional materials, conventional supply chain, so that you can take it and, and run with it, um, you know, literally. So um, let's look at some different ways to do this, right? So today, you can take, you know, there are a number of products out there that combine flexible electronics with some rigid modules and integrate electronics into clothing for different use cases, right? You've got Reebok's check light product, which is a sports impact indicator for contact sports. Goes underneath the helmet. You've got Under Armour's E39 shirt. It's got a puck in the middle with electronics, and then it's got sensors in the shirt. It's been used at the NFL Combine. You've got Catapult Sports, which has a biometric vest for monitoring vitals um, for ath elite athletes. You've got Recon with their ski goggles with a pop-up display and can tell you your vertical and your speed and where you are in the mountain. Um, and then one I like, um, Mimo, a smart baby monitor integrated into a onesie. So you can see you know, how your young toddler or infant is sleeping, whether they're moving. You can check out skin temperature, respiration, things like that. So, um, you know, and I guess the, the further category is, you know, not all sensing has to be wearable, right? So there are ways to passively and silently collect data that uh, don't depend on wearables. Um, so sleep quality is a good example. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, the company Bedit, which has a strip that goes on top of the mattress and measures um, the level of sleep activity. For consumers, you've got a, a company called Early Sense that makes a pad that goes underneath the hospital bed and can very sensitively measure vibration to understand respiration and heart rate and motion and when people are getting you know, in and out of, of bed. Um, a company called ResMed has a, a, a bedside table mounted device that can analyze sleep. Um, and then other things that we do through the course of our routine, um, stepping on the scale in the morning. So Wi-Fi connected scales, um, adding additional sensing functionality into that like Withings has done. Um, so being able to look at the environmental temperature, being able to sense body impedance for uh, body fat level, et cetera. So, and then the, probably the best known example is the Nest thermostat, right? So loaded with sensors um, and adjusting uh, both based on consumer behavior and the environment. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, a well-known example. So the key for digital health is to go beyond, uh, you know, it's beyond the wrist and go other places on the body where you want to measure different types of things, right? And what you need is a form factor that consumers will not just tolerate, but actually embrace, right? And if you can get to that seamless sensing, you know, there are applications you can go after, and I won't go through them all, right? But activity level to combat obesity or tremor or gait analysis, uh, tremor analysis for neurological disorders, gait analysis for rehab, um, many, many to go th that we could go through. Um, so a bunch on the consumer health side, and then you know, very big opportunity on the biotech and pharma side during drug development, right? Uh, measuring not only protocol adherence and, and compliance, but also getting systematic and continuous data collection during clinical trials. I was amazed to learn how much we still rely on sort of manual logbook entries for when we're developing drugs, right? So there's an opportunity to, to tailor patient treatment and dose and strengthen claims, lots of different things that can be done to improve things. And so there's a real opportunity to go beyond the pill and improve outcomes and value by tying wearables into how drugs are both developed and, and used. So um, you know, kind of the most extreme examples of seamless sensing, um, you can get into soft, stretchy form factors. And this is the kind of stuff that, we were, that we're doing at MC10, really making epidermal electronics possible. Um, this is the BioStamp, a sensor patch um, that's tailored by use case. And the idea is it enables electronics to be deployed in discrete ways, really anywhere on the human body. And you know, probably if we, if we run the video, um, you know, one of my favorite examples is uh, a next generation baby monitor where you have a soft sticker. I don't know if we're able to run the video, but uh, there we go. Um, you know, the idea is a soft sticker that goes on a sleeping baby, um, totally unknown to them, but it can send a smartphone alert to a sleeping parent if there's a spike in fever or a change in, uh, in respiration. So something you know, that uh, is completely seamless and, uh, and baby friendly. So a uh, you know, final way to make sensing invisible is to actually go inside the body, right? So Proteus uh, Digital Health 
has commercialized its, indent, its uh, ingestible sensor. It's got a companion wearable patch. And that confirms the exact medication a patient has taken. So they're able to really get into you know, digital pharmaceuticals. Uh, given Imaging has a pill cam for gastrointestinal imaging that, as it passes through your di digestive tract. At MC10, we've put um, electronics onto balloon catheters to make them smart, be able to sense what's happening inside the beating heart. So you've got products which exist already that collect quality data from inside the body and outside the body. And as they get more um, seamless, adoption of those technologies will grow. So um, I don't think that's my slide. Um, help me out there. So um, just a couple things on what can go wrong. Um, while well, these guys look for the slide. So, you know, the, um, the more seamless body integrated computing gets, the more concerns there are about the big brother nature of technology. And, um, okay, there we go. So, um, there are lots of different things that can happen when, uh, you know, as you, where, where patient safety is really paramount. Um, and so, having trust with the consumer, thinking about um, privacy and security in addition to the safety of the patient is super important, right? And that's something that really needs to be managed. Um, there are ch other challenges and headwinds that exist as you go about um, commercializing technology. I don't have time to go through all of them here. But, um, you know, the nature of, of development in healthcare, that there are multiple stakeholders involved, right? Technology companies, providers, payers, regulators. You all have to step forward at the same time. That can be challenging at times. It's also, a lot of these problems are very interdisciplinary. So you've got to um, work together. There's not a single company that can provide a completely integrated solution. And that takes time. It takes work on the business model and um, making sure there's agreement on where value is created and how that value is going to be shared. And then, you know, I guess the last thing is you've got to think about how you maintain engagement with the patient or the consumer over time, right? So um, as many as one-third of uh, wearables users stop using them after the first six months. And, uh, you know, there, are needs to be, there needs to be software applications and value that's created to keep that engagement going. And we heard about some of that this morning. So um, just to summarize, um, you know, body integrated computing is not just about sensing, right? I, I've spoken a lot about sensors today, but it's really important to, uh, to understand that it takes a simple system solution for it all to work, right? So you've got the sensing itself, you've got algorithms and wireless connectivity that happens in the background, you've got analytics that need to be combined on top of that and need to work quickly and provide a, uh, a targeted answer and ultimately get to the point where they can be predictive, right? So alert you to something that's about to happen, um, not something that you already know, right? And that's, that ties into the silent nature of how sensing can be valuable and how this can be an integrated solution. And I think, um, I can't underscore enough, the, the bottom of this slide, uh, making a solution that's mindlessly simple for the user um, is super important. It's gotta be passive, it's gotta be secure, but it's gotta be something that not just the early technology adopters are going to use, but something that you know, a little kid or your grandmother could uh, you know, eagerly adopt. And so if we can make that happen, you know, we get to this cycle of goodness, right, that is a, sim a simple system solution. And um, you know, I think it creates the same kind of opportunity that we saw in the semiconductor industry you know, back in the 1990s, right? You have a chance to combine you know, high resolution data collection with massive data analytics and integrate that and automate that into a, into a really simple solution. And so I'm excited about working on that and I hope you know, a number of you will uh, join me in that challenge. Thanks very much.